Good morning. As we gather together this morning, uh, it, by way of announcements, if you haven't already grabbed a copy of the meeting report for the congregational meeting after worship, um, they are, if not on the chair out there next to the lectern, I know there's some on the back table in front of the lounge. Um, so we will have that after worship. We'll have Michelle play the post flute if anybody needs to get up to either stand for a minute or to excuse themselves for a moment, please do that and then we'll be get, gathered right together back in here again. Um, if after that we haven't exhausted the time already and folks are, are interested, uh, we still have the ministerium per vigil going on over at the park uh, in, in the main pavilion uh, at 12.30, it goes about 10-15 minutes. Uh, and, and that's where that will be. Uh, we're set to have a deacon's meeting tomorrow night at 7, uh, Tuesday choir practice, Thursday. This Thursday and then next Thursday, uh, PW's uh, program, um, the Rock, the Road, and the Rabbi, the first part, uh, everybody's invited to come, and, and we'll be having that at uh, 6.30. Um, and then next Sunday we have uh, the next we have uh, fifth Sunday in Lent, and again the, the vigil uh, in the park. Um, I did Jeff Black as moderator has written a really pretty good article. Um, his reflections on going to one of the big Vatican museums and seeing Michelangelo's David but likening that the way it's set up, that everybody sees that, but they miss all kinds of other things. And looking at how that actually might be a template for how we view church in the age of COVID. Uh, it's a really good article, and with Jeff's permission, we posted it to our website as well as to the Presbytery's website. Um, and if you go in through the uh, upcoming events tab, uh, you'll, you'll see it at the bottom of that page. Uh, are there other announcements this morning? Alan, and then I. Today's the last day for the Easter flower orders to be in. Today's last day for Easter flower orders to come in. So please do that. Mina. Uh, Lying at you, Randy Griffin. Uh, a lot of people know him. He's back in the Cleveland Clinic. He's having trouble with his. Um, uh, Liver. He's had liver transplant years past, and he's, I don't know, trying to uh, decide if it won't stay in the body. And I'm going to be having surgery on Wednesday at the Butler Hospital, or Tuesday at the Butler Hospital. Okay. Uh, Randy Griffin, who's having liver difficulties and is in Cleveland Clinic, and Nina, who's set to have some, is that day surgery, Nina? Or? What? Are, are they doing that just in the course of the day on, on Tuesday? Yeah. yeah, okay. Surgery on Tuesday uh, at BMH. Um, in other prayer concerns, uh, unfortunately, computers are only as smart or as gifted as their operators, and you'll see. Diane Batter still listed as being in the hospital. She has not gone back in the hospital. I erased that. Unfortunately, when I erased that in the category, I must have neglected to hit save, so it didn't. Um, she's still doing okay. Uh, please keep um, <coughs> Kim Gresh in prayer. Um, Kim, if you hadn't seen it on the prayer chain, Kim uh, uh, had had a mammogram. Uh, and a follow-up MRI. Uh, they've discovered a couple of, of tumors, uh, and she's going to have uh, radical mastectomy on uh, Wednesday at McGee Women's. That's correct timing, is it not? Okay. Um, John Stoops is getting ready to come up with uh, treatment number six. Uh, he's still handling that pretty well. He's not had to have any uh, transfusions or much in the way of supportive care that way. 
He's doing okay. Uh, they're hopeful that in another six weeks, if the insurance company approves it, he'll be able to have another PET scan. So please continue to keep that in prayer. Uh, Scott Burns, uh, who is Ann Trainer's nephew, uh, he's in his 50s and he's just had a stroke, so please keep him in your prayers. Uh, Josh Benici uh, is in the ER at the moment. That's part of the reason Mark is not here, because he's there with Mark. Uh, or with Josh, and Josh is in the process of passing a kidney stone. Anybody who's done that knows just exactly how much fun that is. Um, and Maddox is home, correct? Maddox is home and doing better, although he's, he's had croup and uh, the flu. I got that right? That's what I thought I remembered. Okay. Um, Please also keep uh, it as cause for joy, uh, Al and Ann Trainer. It's their 51st anniversary coming up here. Um, let's see, what others might we have this morning in need of mention? Lori. I'm having my second cataract surgery on Wednesday. <laughs> Lori's eye surgery on Wednesday, uh, and that's to get the, get the second one removed, not to add another one, right? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any others? Yes? Um, on Wednesday, my husband Jack or John, whatever you want to call him, uh, <laughs> is going to back down to Belair's and Benbrook Road. His left eye, he had two major surgeries on it, but what, or the pressure's going back up to 34. And they have to figure out what they're going on. I'm hoping he doesn't have to have surgery again. Okay. Uh, Jack's having eye pressure problems after having had surgery already. That's the point you said Wednesday? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and hope that they can get through that okay without having to do any more surgery. Thank you. you most certainly get it. Others? Okay, let us prepare to join our hearts together in worship as we listen to the prelude. Thank mm -hmm.
As we join together in worship, let us join together around our call to worship. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. O oh, Lord of life, as we gather in your presence in your house on this day, we ask and we appeal to you as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you, the Father of glory, that through him you would bestow upon us the Holy Spirit of wisdom and revelation, that we might have true knowledge of him, and that having the eyes of our hearts enlightened, we may know that true hope to which he calls us. In our worship, we seek always to know you who put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all the church, his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Lord, all this we seek by that eternal name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. Yet Christ died for us. He rose for us. He reigns in power for us and he prays for us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that one is a new creation. The old life is past and gone and a new life has begun. Let us give glory to God for the forgiveness we receive through his Son. And 
we were quite a ways from Dormont at that point, and my mother pulled over and said, okay, who wants to walk home from here? And we got very, very quiet, very, very quickly. Because people just didn't argue with Cynthia Stewart. Um, why do I mention that? Well, there are lots of times in our lives when we get complaining about all the things we think we don't have instead of looking at the things that we do have. And we pay a lot more attention to those and we grumble and we moan and we complain. And whether it's our employer, whether it's our parents, whether it's our, our kids, our neighbors, whomever, we grouse and complain and we get downright ugly and nasty. And that's not a new thing. In our first scripture lesson this morning, we're going to hear about the Israelites who did just that in the wilderness. And they complained that God was trying to kill them. They complained that Moses was trying to kill them. They didn't like the food, even though the manna they were getting was called the food of angels. They didn't like the quail. They were, they were sick of chicken. Um, and they just moaned and complained about everything. And God said, I brought you up out of Egypt. And they said, we're, we're done. We, we want to go back. We're, we're, we're tired of this. And God basically pulled the car over. And the story goes that, uh, that we'll hear in a minute that God allowed snakes, vipers, oh, uh, fiery serpents to come out. And many were bit, and quite a few died quite painfully. And they repented publicly, said, we've sinned against Moses, and we've sinned against you. We complained way too much, way too often. Please, take away this mean, nasty punishment. And God provided a way for that to happen. Why do I mention that? Well, in this Lenten season, as we prepare to celebrate Easter, which is resurrection, we have to remember that in order for resurrection to happen, a death first had to occur. And that death was on us, meaning we're responsible, but it was for us, in that if we look up to him who died, we can be saved. Our first lesson for this morning is taken from the 21st chapter of Numbers, verses 4 through 9. Let us hear the word of God. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way, and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no food and no water. We loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take the serpents away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, a brazen serpent, and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, yet shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, that one would look at the bronze serpent and live. Our second passage is taken from Paul's letter to the Ephesians from the second chapter. And you were dead in trespass and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved by faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, 
not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then finally, from the third chapter of John's Gospel, beginning at the 14th verse. And as Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in him is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. This is the word of the Lord. Many of us think of ourselves as good people. I mean, it, 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 let's be honest. I mean, how often do we look around and say, "Well, I'm pretty good," right? Um, especially as we look at at those other people, and boy, they're mean. 
They're nasty. Some of them are pretty icky looking. They sound mean and nasty and ugly. You know, if you watch the, the TV, especially the cable news channels, pretty soon you become convinced that everybody hates everybody and everybody's bad, except for us, whoever the us is. Yeah, and, and we have a way of narrowing things down that way. Thank you. And we do it all the time. It's progressive, and it, it started as we, I mean, it started well before our reading from numbers, but it's, it's always been around. But we see it concentrating a lot in different areas. And it's very self centered. It, it, it does that all the time. And if you wonder about that, uh, think about this. A hundred years ago, plus or minus, uh, one of the first big, well, magazines with lots of photos came out. It was a journal called Time. And then Time followed up with the other half that dealt more with features and, and world events and things like that, and that was called Life. So you have this division now between time and life. And then not so long after that, another magazine came along that was dedicated to looking at popular culture, uh, particularly popular individuals, and that magazine was called People. So now you've gone from time to life, and now you've focused it down to people. Well, then it gets even more um, conceded after that, because from people, then you wind up with a magazine called Us. Now, if there's an us, there must be a them, right? So you have us and them. Then another magazine came out about 25 years ago called Self. And if that wasn't self-centered enough, then you wind up with Oprah magazine. Oprah Winfrey, who comes out with her own magazine titled O. Oh. So we go from all of time, to time and life, to people, to us, to self, to O. Oh. And it's all about us. Because we're pretty neat, we love us enough about me, how do you feel about me? And we look at that in these passages and we see that right away, that the people of the Israelites, have been released from almost, well, the better part of 500 years of harsh bondage. 430 years in the wilderness. They're in, 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 extra, in slavery in Egypt. God releases them in a mighty way with testimonies that they really can't do anything to prove against. I mean, there are those folks who will say occasionally, you know, it, it, it's not credible to believe that God could part the Red Sea to let the Israelites walk across. And they will propose that actually they walked across a, a swampy tidal marsh called the Sea of Reeds. It's only about six feet deep. The thought that comes to me is, well, maybe... If they did it that way, wouldn't it prove a greater miracle if God managed to drown an entire Egyptian army in six feet of water? But as they come out, they grumble. They grumble because there's no food. God provides them with food. They grumble because God's mean to them, and he doesn't talk to them because Moses has been up on the mountain, and God hasn't shown them proof that he's right there and doing what they want, so they make the golden calf. And they walk away, and then they, God forgives them for that, and they complain, and complain, and complain, and they argue against the very fact that God has provided them with everything they need as he leads them out from Egypt, and takes the time to prepare them as a people to become a nation. And they complain against Moses, they complain against Aaron, they complain against all of it, and all like it. How many of us have ever said, okay, to a kid or to somebody who works for us or with us, and you, they wind up complaining and complaining, and finally you say, if you're going to keep, if, if you're 
you're going to not listen, I'm going to quit talking. Some of my mother's loudest expressions were some of her quietest. And when she would come to me with that kind of expression, I knew I'd done something wrong and what I wanted to, to yell out at my mother was, please don't look at me in that tone of voice. God effectively does that, but he does it in a way that get, captures their attention at the same time it punishes their sin. Their sin of rebellion against him. And there are these fiery serpents. People have argued over what the fiery serpent means. They don't know whether it's a, the color red, that, that was the color of that certain type of snake. There are a couple of them that were indigenous to, to the Sinai that were that color. Or it could be because it caused a fiery wound that was incredibly painful. Either way, it was a fiery snake. And they asked, they, they recognized their own sin. If for no other reason than because they got caught. How many of us feel more guilty of something we've done when we've gotten caught? I mean, how many of us, let's put it this way, how many of us have ever driven at 78 or 80 miles an hour? When do you feel guilty about that? <laughs> With the flashing strokes, and you know that you are busted. They got busted. And they say, God, please, please, whatever, take, take this away from us. And God needs to show them exactly what the cost is. And he sets up a prototype. And the prototype is that they will have to look up at the remedy he provides. And that's where this brass serpent comes in. Lifted up high up on a pole. And that moves us in then to, the, to, to Jesus' words from the John passage. Because he says, look, I, I've got to be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. And as he says this, it's still not clear in people's minds exactly what he means. But he's saying, no, it's got to be me. I have to be lifted up. I have to be the thing sacrificed in order for sins to be forgiven. And he goes on, and we have those words that are so incredible for us that most of us memorize as children. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And how often do we forget the cost? I mean, that's, that's where the, the words of our anthem this morning are so marvelous. Depth of mercy, can there be, can there be mercy still reserved for me? Can my God his wrath forbear? Me, the chief of sinners, spare. O Master, I have denied, I, have, I afresh have crucified, oft profaned this hallowed name. Put him to an open shame. And here Jesus is saying, no, I have come, not that the world may be condemned, but that it may be spared. And yet the thing that he says and sets out, and then Paul doubles back around on in the Ephesians passage is, what is he saving us from? Is he saving us just so we can make a decision to join the winning team? No, he's saving us from the condemnation under which we already struggle. It's not like, well, I have the decision not to go to hell. No, the decision is, am I going to grasp the hand that has already reached down for me? Am I going to go where he pulls me and draws me? Will I put my faith in him and look up at the one who has been lifted up? Because what Jesus says after saying, I've come, not that the world may be condemned, but that the world may may live, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he's not believed in the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. And that's where we pick up with those words of Paul's. And you were dead in trespass and sin. Paul doesn't come in and say, hey, how many of you feel guilty? How many of you just want a better life? How many of you want to be incredibly good looking or at least above average? Paul hits them with none of that. 
He says, and you were dead in trespass and sin. Boom. We have enough people in this congregation who've had some serious debility or illness. What is it like to get word from the doctor that you don't want to hear? It's pretty shattering. They could be words that are terrifying. And yet, if you do not hear those words, what can you not seek? Treatment or cure, because you didn't realize you were ill. And here it's put out before us, but it says, but we don't have to stay there. We don't have to be locked there. You know, we don't have to be stuck in the passions uh, of our sins and our disobedience. We don't have to follow the, the prince of the power of the air. The prince of the power of the air. What, what is it that Jesus has just called Satan? A big gas bag. He talks loud. He makes lots of noise and people listen to him and he gets attention. But he has no actual authority or power except that which he's usurped and stolen. And God's going to demand account for that. And he says, no. <laughs> but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespass, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him, seated with him in the heavenly places. For by grace you have been saved by faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. We didn't make the conditions happen, God did. God provided everything needed for our salvation. And the thing that we provided was the need for our salvation because of our sin. Or put, put another way, we supplied the cross, we supplied the nails, we supplied the sin. God provided the remedy in the death of his son by putting him on the cross and raising him up that we might look to him and realize that we are saved by grace, by faith, not by works. And yet, because of that, we are recreated for good works in him that God has prepared from before time. So as we look at that, let us remember continually throughout this Lenten season that he must be lifted up for our salvation. And we must look up to him and see him for who he is and what he has done. We are saved by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, him crucified and lifted up. Let us look unto him. Amen. Let us join together before the throne of, of grace, lifting our hearts before him who has assured us that when we call to, upon him, he will give, he will hear and will give answer. Lord our God, you who have given us your own beloved Son, that we might not be condemned to the outer darkness for all eternity, but have lifted us up by his death and resurrection on our behalf, we come before you thankful in all that you have done and all that you continue to prepare for us and deliver to us and through us as the works of your hands. We come before you often broken, frequently shamefaced, uncomfortable, sad, depressed, and yet you lift us up you heal us, and you make us new. As we come before you, we, this community, this body of believers in this place, this extension of the Church of Jesus Christ, we, we ask that you would hear us, that as we worship you, we might worship in spirit and in truth, that as we raise 
our hearts and our voices before you, you would fill them to overflowing with the power of your Holy Spirit at work in and raining down upon us. We ask, Lord, as a people called according to your Son's name, as those who are the priesthood of believers, we ask that you would be with our neighbors, our brothers and sisters, our friends, our family, that as we speak words, they might hear them. As we work acts of love with the hands that you have given, that they might receive and feel them and might know that they come from you. Lord, we ask that you would be with those who are in authority over us within the church and in the world around us, that you would provide them with wisdom, with a desire for justice and righteousness tempered by mercy, that you would be with those who protect us and keep us safe, who defend us and our liberties, who protect us from ourselves and each other, from the elements, from disaster and disease. Lord, we ask in a particular way that you would be with Kim as she prepares to undergo this surgery, that it might obtain quick and lasting impact. We ask that you would be with Evelyn as she continues to undergo treatment, that you would be with John Stoops as he continues to undergo treatment, that you would smooth the hurdles before him, that he might receive the testing that he truly needs. Lord, be with Scott Burns. Provide him swift recovery, we pray, with Josh, that he might have your comfort and a, a swift resolution. Be with Randy Griffin. Be with Nina in her upcoming surgery. Continue to lift up and heal Maddox. We pray that he might improve swiftly and well. We ask that you be with Jack as he goes for more diagnostic testing for his eye. And Relieve those pressures, we pray, be with Dory as she has her other eye repaired. And Lord, be with Alan and as we give you thanks and praise for a 51st anniversary in a time when that's not so common as it once was. Lord, all these things we bring before you, the things known and the things unknown, but knowing that you know all of them and that you hear all that we raise before you, that your spirit intercedes with groans too deep for words, even when we don't know what to pray for as we ought. Being mindful of that, Lord, we come before you, and we pray as your Son has taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand and affirm what we believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated.
Lord, as we come before you, as we extend our hands with the gifts, the offerings, the tithes that you deserve, we ask that you would receive them from our hands, that you would receive our lives as offerings of thanks and praise, that all of this as we return it to you, we ask that you would bless and multiply and use it to proclaim your name and your son's gospel throughout the world to be the hands and feet and the mouths but to provide that word and that work to every corner of the world until he returns again in glory. All this we ask in his name. Amen.